what a night it's been. For me, it's been a trip down memory lane, firstly all my classmates here, and then that good old-fashioned 1970s feminism. I haven't heard it for a long time. <laughs> Um, and the other thing I'd say to Kathy is, see me after class, I have something for you. Um, so, uh, when Brooke sent me an email asking me to be the keynote speaker tonight, I immediately sent an email back to her saying, oh my gosh, am I interesting enough? And as soon as I hit the send button, I thought, what a girly thing to do. <laughs> that is so insane. And luckily, Brooke said, yes, I was interesting enough, so here I am this evening. Um, but, you know, at any time you can hook me off the podium, that's okay. So, what I thought I'd talk to you tonight um, about is my path in life, um, how I've come to be a leader, a little about the Women's Initiative Network, and finally about volunteerism and philanthropy and the Clayman Institute. Now, before I get into uh, the body of my remarks, I'd just like to say that two of my least favorite words are should and ought. And when you're in the business school, you know, you're subject to a lot of pressure, you know, how you should be, what you ought to do. And uh, I would say, you know, be true to yourselves. My own two basic rules are don't harm yourself, don't harm other people and then figure out what's right for you. And also, as we've heard earlier today, don't be judgmental about others. Uh, so, you know, as your lives go along, some of you may choose to have five nannies to take care of your kids and be in the workforce. Others of you will choose to step out for a while. Just do whatever is right for you, but also have the courage that if your choice doesn't make sense, be able to change your mind. And at the same time, don't be judgmental about the choices that other people have made because you never know what their life is like unless you've walked a mile in their Manolos. <laughs> so, back to me. Uh, I was born in England in the 1950s and I grew up in the 50s, 60s and 70s. Although, as some of you who know me know, it's, I'm not sure that I've ever really grown up. Um, so, women like Mara Strober and Joanne Martin really paved the way for me because if it hadn't been for brave women like them, I couldn't have had the life that I've had. So, one of the galling things, uh, oh, and you probably figured out from my voice, I you know, grew up in England and it was even worse there than it was in the States. Um, but one of the very galling things was that sometimes, you know, I'd ask, why not? And the answer would be, because you're a girl. And it would just infuriate me. And, you know, I'd sort of try and figure out, okay, what were the objective criteria for whatever? And, you know, it'd be grades in school, leadership, roles in school, sports, whatever. And I'd do that, and I'd do them as well, if not better, than some of the boys. And, you know, I'd say, why not? And they'd say, because you're a girl. Um, now, my mother gave me a wonderful piece of advice, which I would pass on to you, and that was, say yes and do what you want. <laughs> Though, of course, my mother would get totally infuriated if I ever used the tactic on her. Um, but it was thanks to my mother that, uh, and the United States that I came to be educated, and just to give you a sense of where I come from, uh, my dad was a bona fide cockney, born within the sound of Bow Bells. Uh, he left school at 14 because that's what working class boys did. Uh, my mom came from a somewhat more prosperous European family and during the Second World War she was sent here to the United States and she lived with an aunt and uncle and cousins. And because everyone in this country went to college, she went to college, uh, which would never have happened if she had stayed in England, uh, as did her older sister, and uh, their adopted sister. And my mother really saw the transformative power of education. And she really insisted that my brother and I be educated, which was you know, somewhat controversial, particularly in my case. And in particular, my um, father's mother uh, was 
very concerned about it. She warned, it will make her eyeballs spin around in her head. <laughs> and I'm sure that uh, the first thing that you noticed about me was these spinning eyeballs. <laughs> Um, but I, I was fortunate enough to win a scholarship to uh, one of the top London girls' schools, and it was an extraordinary place. It was one of the first girls' schools founded in England in 1850. And one of the things that was amazing about it was that, you know, being a good English school, we'd have prayers every morning, and then there'd be assembly, and the headmistress would tell us stirring tales about old girls. You know, and they were being flying doctors in Australia, or they were nursing the sick in Africa, or they were on the stage at the National Theatre. So you got the idea that it was incumbent upon all of us to really lead worthy lives. And the school had a very rich history because uh, many of the girls from the old girls from the late 19th century, early 20th century, were part of the suffragette move movement that got women the vote. You know, and you think about women paving the way, the suffragette movement took 50 years. And I look at this country at people like uh, Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton, and I thought, those gals really had staying power. You know, we have nothing to complain about. Uh, so, you know, the school was one of those places that sent a very high percentage of girls to university for the time and a lot to Oxford and Cambridge. And when I was 15, my history teacher came over to me and said, okay, Michelle, well, she didn't say okay, because she wouldn't have said that, you know, back then. Uh, she said, Michelle, you are going to go to Oxford and you will read either history or PPE, that's philosophy, politics, and economics, which um, I did end up reading. And I said to her, yes, Miss Weaver. And sure enough, a few years later, there I was at Oxford uh, reading PPE. So when I was at Oxford, uh, well, when I was in school and then at Oxford, my main interest was journalism. And you know, I loved working on magazines and papers. And at university, I also got involved with drama. But I also became intrigued with the idea of going into banking because the UK at the time was going through this dire financial crisis and you'd turn on the news and there'd be all this discussion. And I didn't understand what was going on and I thought it would be really interesting to try and figure it all out. Now, in those biz days, business was seen as very déclassé in England, uh, and there was enormous pressure, particularly for girls or women, uh, to go into either teaching or the civil service. Now, I knew that I wasn't interested in teaching, but I saw on the bulletin board in college there was a thing for internships in the civil service, so I signed up for that, and they sent me to the Ministry of Defense, and it was simply dreadful. And I thought, okay, that's it for civil service. Um, so then I became interested in business and uh, we had a neighbor whose family was in the city, uh, so the city is what you call Wall Street in England. And I, I chatted with him and he said, you know, Michelle, even though you've got an Oxford degree, the, the British banks really aren't going to be interested in you. Go to an American bank uh, they really won't care that you're a woman, and uh, they will train you much better. So I thought, okay, whatever, uh, except we didn't say whatever in those days. <laughs> but I said the 20th century version of whatever. Uh, so I interviewed with Bank of America, and I, I, uh, they invited me down to London, and they offered me a job on the spot, and I thought, oh, that was easy. Um, and, but it was also pretty interesting because some of their female employees had sued them in a class action suit in San Francisco. I see some nodding heads. So I'm sure I was an okay kid, um, but probably, you know, seeing an Oxford educated woman, woman interested in banking, they, that was why they welcomed me with open arms. So, you know, it really ticks me off. Sometimes you meet women who say, oh, the women's movement did nothing for me. You have to look back in the history and see that there were plenty of people who did do stuff for you. Uh, but it was interesting, the night before I was due to start work, you know, my dear old dad said to me, you know, Michelle, I can't understand why anyone would employ you and pay you good money. And I said, well, why not, Dad? And he said, well, because you're a girl. 
So I spent two very happy years at Bank of America, and you all probably would just laugh at the job that I had. Uh, what I did was I spread statements by hand. And, um, you know, some of you remember what that was like, but what that meant was I took hard copy annual reports and I had an adding machine and I either uh, longhand or with the adding machine computed ratios. And I also wrote up credit reports. Uh, and I just thought the job was thrilling. I thought it was great. <laughs> and um, I really hadn't thought about an MBA, but uh, I was one of only two bachelor's students in the uh, MBA training program. And the other one was a Cambridge educated guy, and he and his friends were always talking about business school. And said, like, oh, whatever, or the 20th century equivalent of whatever. <laughs> Um, and, uh, but what happened was a couple of the VPs for whom I worked uh, took me aside one day and they said, you're, you're a clever girl, you should really uh, think of applying to business school. And I did what I now advise young people not to do. I um, applied last minute in round three. <laughs> not a good strategy. Uh, go round one or go round two. Uh, and they sent me a postcard saying, well, we got your staff, you know, don't call us, we'll call you, and it, it'll take you, take at least six weeks. And then the following day, I got a telegram saying, you've been accepted. <laughs> so it's like, oh, that was easy. <laughs> um, so it was interesting. My parents were distraught because my mother rightfully knew that I would never go back again. My dad was distraught for a totally different reason. He said, you know, Michelle, you've got a really great job. Please don't give it up. You may never get another job. <laughs> so I said, no, I think I probably can. So I figured out, you know, how to finance it and uh, to come out, out here, which was just amazing. And, you know, we all arrived in 1977. I think women had really been only allowed into the business school in, what, the previous 10, 12 years or so. Uh, I, I looked at Erica to confirm all the history stuff. <laughs> so Stanford was a real eye-opener for me. Uh, it was here that I met two of the great loves of my life, uh, computers and modern portfolio theory. And I won't talk in this forum about the other loves of my life, but there are photos. <laughs> and Luann has them. <laughs> uh, but it was also here that I learned to drink margaritas and uh, sit in hot tubs and go to toga parties, all very new experiences. And it was the age of Animal House, but it was also the age of disco and uh, the age of Saturday Night Fever. And one of my proudest accom uh, accomplishments here was figuring out how to hack into the GSB computer and learn how to send out notices of where we were going to go disco dancing uh, that night. And I'd like to acknowledge uh, two of my fellow disco queens who are sitting at this table, <laughs> Luann Winchell and Esther Koch. So for my summer internship, I got sucked into the shoulds and the oughts, and uh, I took a job with McKinsey, uh, which was a wonderful experience because it's a great firm, but I realized that consulting was probably not what I should be doing. And particularly at that time, I thought that the politics would be very hard for me to navigate, and um, I probably needed something with my own P&L. But I, I decided I would work my butt off, and, uh, and we didn't use the word butt back in the 20th century either. Uh, and, um, you know, made sure that I came out of the summer with an offer. <laughs> now, when, when I was here at Stanford, one of my best friends and I, we had a game where we used to come up with uh, a list of 35 small business ideas. And some of them were pretty wacky, like a California goat cheese factory which I think actually would have turned into a decent business. Um, but I knew I was interested in 
having a business, and one of the things that Stanford taught me was that you could conceive of an entire business that wasn't just a mom and pop operation. But I was going to graduate from a business school at the age of 26, and I thought that there was no way that I would be ready to start a business. So what I did was I went to Wall Street, and I went to Solomon Brothers, and I went into the unfashionable area of sales and trading. And I don't know if how many of you have read Liar's Poker, but that was my life. Uh, I actually taught the training class that Michael Lewis was in. <laughs> Seriously. Um, and then at the beginning of 1980, the firm decided to form a quantitative research group in the equity area. And they came to me and they asked me to go in there because they thought I was a cerebral kind of kid. And when I had interviewed, I flung around terms like alpha and beta. <laughs> Little jargon goes a long way. Uh, so they said if I didn't like it, I could go back and do whatever I wanted in sales and trading. And I thought, oh, this sounds pretty interesting. And my Stanford classmates were horrified. One of them called me up and said, you must have done something terrible to be sent into quantitative equity research. <laughs> and, um, and I'll tell you afterwards who it was. <laughs> uh, and I was like, no, no, I think this is going to be fun. And it was great. I took to it like a duck to water. Uh, I uh, built models and I wrote research papers. And uh, because I was the cute girl in the group, I was the one that was sent on the road to talk to clients. Uh, and the, uh, the other members of the group were brilliant, but they were math PhDs, physics PhDs, didn't really speak English. <laughs> and, and I apologize to any math or um, physics PhDs in, in the audience. So. Um, it was a great experience. I used to travel with screwdrivers in my briefcase. This was pre obviously pre-9-11 because quite often when I got to customer sites, I'd have to whip out the screwdrivers and assemble their PCs or you know, open their PCs up and make sure the modem was installed right. And my job was really helping them use quantitative methods in their investment processes. And if the problem was easy enough, I could program it there on the fly. If it was more complicated, I'd take it back to New York and have one of our other programmers work on it. But, you know, I've also been very involved with more traditional analysis, not just quant analysis, with the Chartered Financial Analyst Program. And it struck me that there was this huge chasm between the way traditional people thought about investments and the way quants did. Ni neither side talked to each other, both sides despised each other. And I thought if you could really try and marry the best of both, you'd end up with something pretty interesting. So I had one of those light bulb moments uh, and I thought, you know, why am I showing people how to do this? You know, why don't I actually try doing it myself? So I teamed up with a couple of guys and uh, I did the MBA thing and I wrote a business plan and we submitted it a couple of places and they both wanted to do it. And so I thought, hey, we must be on to something. So I started my firm uh, 21 years ago this past February. Uh, I was young, I was bold, I was foolish. I was 32 at the time, I had money in the bank, I thought it was the time that I could afford to take entrepreneurial risk uh, because I thought that if things didn't work out, I, my reputation probably was good enough that I could go back to the street and get a decent job. But it was also partly because um, I thought I had the ability to become an MD at Solomon. I was one of only two women running a group at that time. But I thought it would be, you know, uh, from here on out it would get increasingly political and I might not be able to navigate those waters. And I thought I would be really mad if I got to be as old as 37 and hadn't made MD. You know, now I look back and it's like, oh, to be 37 again. <laughs> but that's another story. So you start a business because you think you know everything, but you know, it's only when you actually start the business that you realize you know nothing. Uh, and I believe that one of the main reasons for success is the total unwillingness to fail. Because there's certainly been times in my business life when people, my friends would say to me, you know, why are you struggling? Why are you doing that? this? Come back to the street. You know, you can make a lot more money on the street. And I would say, no, 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 this is, you know, what I set out to do. 
So the way I look back on those 21 years is the first five years were kind of interesting, they're in startup mode. Um, second five years were tough, just keeping the business going. Then the next five years got better, and then the last six have pretty much been a blast. Um, but, you know, it's been a pretty long haul. Now, neither of my original partners is still with me. Uh, along the way, I've picked up three other terrific partners, and at this point, we're managing uh, somewhat over $6 billion with a staff of 33, soon to be 34 with the addition of Summer Barguti. Uh, so, Brooke and Anne asked me to come up with some takeaways for you as you think about your careers. And I thought, oh, I'm going to sound so pompous. You know, it kind of reminds me in Hamlet, you know, Polonius talking to Laertes, neither a borrower nor a lender be, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> um, but here are some takeaways. Uh, so, you know, my first, just to reiterate, it, don't harm yourself and don't harm others. But also, as I look at, back at my life, you know, don't be afraid to go against the grain. Seek advice and new experiences. And one of, the, uh, for those of you in the first year, if you haven't already done so, the career view is a great way to do that. Uh, in my life, I've felt it's been important to have a belt and suspenders approach to qualifications so that no one uh, can ever answer your why not question with the fact that you're unqualified. Though, of course, in England, suspenders are garters, so what I'd say to you is wear a belt and a garter belt. <laughs> um, be part of the solution, not of the problem. It's totally okay to come up with ideas for change, but make sure that you're seen as a team player rather than a, a perpetual whiner. And remember, things can take an awfully long time. You know, it's very easy when you're young to have ants in your pants, um, but you've got to take the long view. Another thing, help others. Do it because it's the right thing. But what you'll find is that when you help others, you will be um, repaid threefold. And equally, help don't haze junior people coming up. I, I remember particularly when I was on the street, you know, people would all, often say, well, you know, I'm giving him a hard time because people gave me a hard time. You know, you don't need to do that. Uh, cut your friends some slack. Don't be too judgmental. Lead by example. You know, don't expect your troops to be in at 7 in the morning if you're going to roll in at 10. That just doesn't cut it. Have a life. Um, you know, work isn't 24-7. Now, another thing that I've found helpful is when you get mad, do a self-check. Make sure that you're not being an ass. You know, it's very easy to get self-righteous. Um, so, you know, before you lose it, pause for a second. And then enjoy yourself, uh, because unfortunately, bad stuff comes down in everyone's life, and you have no idea what it's going to be. But it's not worth worrying about it. You know, I think all you can do is hope that when it happens in your own life, that you will have the mental and moral fortitude to deal with it. So now quickly, what I'd like to do is shift topics to what we're trying to do with the Women's Initiative Network that uh, is called WIN. And uh, the genesis for me goes back three years to our 25th reunion, and there was a women's tea with a discussion moderated by Mara Strober. And it was pretty interesting because, as Brooke mentioned, there were 68 women in our class, and I think close to 50 showed up for this tea party. And it was pretty amazing because the discussion spiraled out of control and it was clear that there were some very unhappy women in the room and some women were unhappy that at the toll that child raising had taken on their career and then there were other women who were very unhappy they said well I did everything that I thought I was supposed to do and I still got shafted and then there was a third group that was like why are you all complaining? You know, life is hard, careers are hard, you know, get a grip. So, what happened was one of our classmates, Susan Harmon, came out and she said, well, we really think we need to continue this conversation. And she collared Linda Barlecki, and L Linda Barlecki collared Donna Hall, and Donna Hall said, well, if you want to get stuff done, we'd better get Michelle. 
Um, so we started uh, talking about you know, the issues. We widened our group. Uh, we included academics, including Mara by speakerphone. We uh, included organizations such as Catalyst, the National Council for Research on Women, the Ms. Foundation, and dare I say it, we even included friends of ours who'd gone to other business schools uh, to try and figure out what should be done. And at the same time, uh, Sharon Marine, who's over there in the development office, to whom you should send all of your checks, um, she was getting letters or talk, having conversations with alums who were concerned about women's issues. Dean Joss was getting letters. And uh, so I decided to leverage my position on the advisory council to talk to the dean and faculty about it. And I have been talking to David Krebs, and I have been running up and down in faculty offices. Uh, and because I thought, you know, why on earth should I be on the AC and not, you know, leverage my position to uh, really address things that are important to me? And uh, Sharon put uh, me in touch with Mary Clark, who's another advisory council member, and we became the leadership of this group. So Wynne is trying to help the GSB and its uh, female students and alums in a number of ways. Uh, admissions, student life, uh, case and curriculum, and alumnus support. So admissions, what we're trying to do is three things. One is increase the yield of uh, the admits, the women who have been accepted. Increase the number of women who think about applying to business schools because law schools and med uh, medical schools are now 50-50, but um, men and women, but nationwide business schools are still only about 25% women. Uh, and then obviously we want to establish Stanford as the brand of choice. Now in student life, um, we believe, as we've been hearing tonight, that there are things that both men and women need to be thinking about, you know, particularly women. So, um, you know, marriage, kids, you know, God forbid, divorce, um, elder care, uh, whatever, uh, so that you can think about these things before you're actually faced with them in your career. Now, in case and curriculum, we're trying to do a number of things. One is to make sure that we have good business cases that feature women protagonists also get more speakers into the classroom. The school does a great job with views from the top, but uh, we understand that there are relatively few women guest speakers coming into regular classes. Uh, and then in alumni support, you know, we want to make sure that we're developing program that are useful to women and men as they go through their lives. And our classmate, Erica Richter, who's here in Lifelong Learning, has put, so far put on three great programs for us this year, and we hope um, that that uh, will continue. Uh, now, you may have seen the women's website is up and running, and we're trying to figure out you know, other ways that alumni can support each other. So, for instance, um, trying to put new mothers in touch or new parents in touch with um, older alums who've gone through that so they can talk through the whole work-life challenge things. What's amazing about Wynn is that we now have some 50 committee members. Our committee members range from the class of 06 um, right up to people who, who graduated in the 60s, and I've just recruited my first 07. Congratulations, Brooke. Um, and in New York, uh, you know, what's very been a lot of fun for me is that I've been working with women from the class of 05, and it's provided a very powerful message to the admits that they can see that someone, you know, from like 79 is actually friends and working with someone from 05. Um, so it's really a very powerful network. And I would encourage any of you in the room who'd like to become involved with it to come and talk to me, talk to Erica, uh, or shoot Erica an email, and you can find out more. So Brooke also asked me to talk a little about the Clayman Institute here on campus. One of the bees in my bonnet is that women really need to step up in philanthropy. So please don't withhold your dollars, write the checks. Uh, and I think Sharon would say write them to Stanford. Um, so, um, 
you know, we, I think it's particularly important now that women are being successful. You know, in my view, serious people do serious things. Now, I don't want us all to turn into harumphing bores, uh, which is quite easy to do, but we really need to step up with leadership roles and responsibilities and talk with our checkbooks. So the Institute is the entity that Mara founded back in 72 as Crow, the Center for Research on Women, uh, because Stanford at the time had no entity really addressing women's needs. Later it became the Institute for Research on Women and Gender, and the Institute has always done groundbreaking work. Uh, its scholars have produced incredible books. It's provided various support, moral, financial, for generations of grad students. Um, but a few years ago, in the early 2000s, the Institute was in an existential bind, and we were without a director, and we were also kind of floating around in the university. So I describe us as being a little like the appendix in the body. You know, no one quite knew why we were there, but when we flared up, we were very troublesome. Um, so, and uh, one of the issues that concerned me was that the Institute lived by what I called fundraising by bake sale, uh, and really living hand to mouth. But then a wonderful set of things happened. One was uh, the late Barbara Finberg, who endowed the directorship, engineered the shift of the Institute into, the depart uh, into humanities and sciences, where we came under the wing of Sharon Long, who was very supportive of the Institute. And uh, faculty member Barbara Jelpe uh, stepped in to become our interim director, and she was able to get permission to do an external search for the next director. And that's how we got Londa Schiebinger. And um, then the development office, after years of discouragement, finally green-lighted uh, the, an endowment drive, because I'd always been saying we've got to put ourselves on solid footing. So I was offered the naming opportunity, and um, you know, another really girly thing. I said, you can have the money, you don't need to name it for little old me. Uh, so Londa Schiebinger took me out to dinner, sat me down, set me straight. And you know, she basically said, okay, uh, if there's a named institute, the university can cannot take it away, or at least it's a lot harder to do that. Secondly, for academics, and this I had no clue about, apparently it's a lot more prestigious to have a named position than any old position. And then the third thing was as a signaling thing, that you probably notice relatively few women's names around campus, um, that Londa thought it was important that a self-made independent woman, you know, step up and do this. So even though I was very concerned that the Almighty would strike me down for my overweening pride, um, I thought, okay, you know, I will go for it, and so far so good, though if a thunderbolt happens at the end of the evening, you know what happened. Um, so, uh, the Institute does a number of things. One of our big studies at the moment is on dual career couples in academia, and there the issue is that uh, many women academics are married or partnered with other academics, so to shift jobs you have to really tend to, you have to shift two people, and as you may be relieved to hear, you know, women will not in general, abandon their husband and their children to move across country for a job. Um, but we really need to think about this, particularly for women, if we want to get more women in senior uh, positions. Uh, we um, also have our um, graduate dissertation fellowships where we're supporting uh, young graduate students coming up. Uh, we have speakers on campus. Uh, last night, Baroness Deitch was talking about bioethics, stem cell research. Uh, our next studies are going to focus on women in Silicon Valley and uh, women entrepreneurs and the challenges that they face. And, you know, in an ideal world, you shouldn't have to have institutions devoted either to issues of gender uh, or issues of ethnicity. Uh, but you may be shocked to find out, I think the world isn't perfect yet. 
Uh, and so, you know, until that time, I'm more than happy to fund cutting edge research so that, you know, other little girls, when they ask why not, they're not told, oh, it's because you're a girl. So, I thank you for inviting me here tonight. Uh, I'm very delighted to see so many men in the audience. Um, and I hope we'll see you again next year. And, you know, one of the things that's just so inspiring to me as a crotchety old biddy is to see, you know, young people like you who are so committed to leadership and business and, you know, I'm confident that you will pave the way for others. So I thank Brooke and Huma and Anne for inviting me tonight. It's been wonderful to work with you and I'm really looking forward to working with Leela and Kate next year. Thank you.